We're just about done with our sleeve installation. Um, this is something that we do here. I don't know if anybody else is doing it. We picked this up a few years ago. Um, we're going to put a pin in here. Some people call it a Dutchman. Uh, we're using special plugs, tapered plugs. They call them seal, uh, seal lace plugs. We're doing crack repair on automotive heads. And what we're trying to do is we're going to drill a hole right between these two, uh, these two metals, the aluminum and the sleeve. And then we're going to tap it with this tapered tap and then put a plug in it, cut it off, and just make that level with the top of it. What we're trying to do here, what we are doing, is this is an insurance policy that this sleeve is never going to spin. I've got all the confidence in the world that our dimensions are accurate. Um, it, it's, like I say, it's an insurance policy and a safety precaution. We don't ever want anything that, like this that we're doing coming back here. So it helps me to sleep at night and gives you a lot of confidence that, you know, the job that you're getting here is, uh, is, is the best you can get, is the best that money can buy. And uh, we pride ourselves on what we're doing here, and it's just an extra step that we take, and I'll show you how we do it. This is a center drill. The diameter of the end of the center drill is uh, 1 8. The drill I'm using is going to be a 1 40 drill. So we're just using this to start, a little pilot hole. And if you remember correctly, the flange on this sleeve is only an eighth of an inch. And that's really all that this is going to touch. Again, this plug is tapered. It's kind of it's biting as it's going in there. And we're just going to cut this off as close as we can to the surface without touching it, and then get it all flat again. Okay, that's the pen. We're level with the top. Um, that's going to hold that sleeve from moving. Next thing we're going to do is I'm going to lap the top of the cylinder. All right, we're all set. We lap the top of the cylinder, and we're going to be putting the studs back in next. Here you can see where we take the sleeve and we match it back into the cylinder, and we match all the ports, transfers included, everything. You shouldn't be seeing any lumps of sleeve in here. You know, no matter where you send it, they should still be doing it the right way. Uh, media blasted inside the exhaust port. I stress relieve these. Most of the time when you see a head come in, it's got these kind of studs sticking out. You're going to have little stress risers in here. We just go ahead and champ for that. Um, next thing we're going to do is install all the studs. You're going to use red Loctite and just going to put a little bit on each stud and install all of them back into the cylinder. Studs are installed. Next step, um, and this is where a lot of people get confused also. When you drop a sleeve in, you still have to bore the cylinder when you're done. This hole is approximately 40,000 smaller than a standard piston, 66 millimeter. So we have to take the cylinder, put it back in the quick way boring bar, and uh, we have to bore it to size for the piston. Again, I'm going to leave, I like to take the last four thousandths off with the, uh, with the hone. So I'm going to shoot for two thousandths, two and a half thousandths piston clearance. They recommend they recommend two thousandths piston clearance on this particular model. I, I still kind of think that's tight. If you get out of any kind of conditions that are optimum and start getting hot, it, it's just too tight. So I'm going to run this thing at two and a half and uh, take the last four with a home. So we're going to take this. At this point, uh, we can just imagine this. We didn't even do the sleeve work. The, procedure, the, the procedures we're going to follow next are just simply to bore a cylinder. And that's what we're going to do. So just to just to recoup on what we've done, we took a 68 millimeter bore, a 68 millimeter bore blaster cylinder, and bored it approximately 81 thousandths, enlarged the hole to accept the sleeve, thermally uh, matched, uh, thermally expanded the um, the cylinder, put the sleeve in, did a counter bore on the top, matched all the ports, dropped the safety pin in, 
um, with four thousandths interference fit just to make sure this thing isn't going to twist all around. I uh, wire brushed the studs, Loctite the studs, reinstalled the studs to the proper torque, cleaned up the gaskets, and sandblasted inside of all of the ports. Now we're going to bore it. We're finished boring the cylinder for the new piston and what I did is I set my bore gauge up and sure enough I've got four thousandths and two tenths to go to get this to the exact size that I want to get it to and again we hone the last four thousandths and uh, the reason I do that is to eliminate any chance of having any peaks and valleys in there and I'll explain what that is next there's a lot of shops around the country that can do this kind of work. I understand that, and most of them are really, really good. But what I want to talk about here is peaks and valleys. And what that pertains to is the finish that you're going to get inside of the cylinder. When we bore this cylinder, we're keeping it much, much smaller than the piston for a reason. You get what's called tool marks. What the tool marks are is a carbide bit that comes down into the cylinder, and it moves this way, you know, this way, very slow. What's going to happen because of the nature of the, the iron that we're cutting, it's going to cut deeper in some spots than in others. So you, it's going to develop tool marks inside of it. If I was to just take a piston without honing the cylinder, and believe it or not, and I've seen it, there are companies where you bore your cylinder, that bore your cylinder for you, and they don't hone it. They don't hone it with a power hone. So what you have when you magnify it, is you have peaks and valleys, high spots and low spots. What in essence happens is your rings flow over this and it's like going through sandpaper. They just get eaten alive. What the interesting part is, is if I was to run a cylinder like this without honing it, after three sets of rings, it would effectively hone itself with the rings. That's, that's not how we do things here, and that's not how anybody should be doing anything by, by any, any stretch of the imagination. After the hone, again, we're going to hone four thousandths. That's a, lot, that's a lot to hone. A lot of shops will do two, one and a half, two and a half. In my opinion, it's not enough. What I'm trying to do by taking that extra amount of material is eliminate all these peaks and valleys from the cutter and when I go into this with a, a 280 grit stone on a finished hone, your, the peaks and valleys are so small that it's not going to affect your rings at all. What you're looking for at the end is a crosshatch pattern. And if you, you, know, you take your stuff wherever you want, it doesn't bother me, but one thing I will tell you, if you ever take a cylinder off of a bike, a you know, cast iron cylinder, and it's not so much a nickel, but if you take a cylinder off of a bike and you see signs of, of the crosshatch pattern, and you also see signs like this, old tool marks in here. And you'll see this sometimes. What that means is wherever you took your cylinder to get bored, um, the guy just didn't take enough with the honing stone. So we know the 4,000th is probably a little excessive, but it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, that last 4,000th that's removed eliminates any chance of any ring failure, and that's why we take 4,000s on the home.